And we're going to, I'm just going to read the first 11 verses to begin with of chapter 29. Hezekiah began to reign when he was 25 years old, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. In the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. He brought in the priests and the Levites and assembled them in the square on the east, and he said to them, Hear me, Levites. Now consecrate yourselves, consecrate the house of the Lord and the God, the God of your fathers and carry out the filth from the holy place. For our fathers have been unfaithful and have done what was evil in the sight of the Lord our God. They have forsaken him and have turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord and turned their backs. They also shut the doors of the vestibule and put out the lamps and have not burned incense or offered burnt offerings in the holy place to the God of Israel." Therefore the wrath of the Lord came on Judah and Jerusalem, and he has made them an object of horror, of astonishment, and of hissing, as you see with your own eyes. For behold, our fathers have fallen by the sword, and our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. Now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord, the God of Israel, in order that his fierce anger may turn away from us. My sons, do not now be negligent. For the Lord has chosen you to stand in his presence, to minister to him, and to be his ministers and make offerings to him. All right, stop there for a minute. King Hezekiah comes at a time when Judah had reached, at least to that point, its lowest point yet. So I have a little diagram here. This kind of will just show you, puts a little context. So we had the king Saul, David, and Solomon Then the kingdom splits. There's Judah, the southern kingdom, and Israel, the northern kingdom. And then those two kingdoms go on their way, and then each has its own kings. The red means that they were wicked, and the blue means that they are good. Hezekiah is from the southern kingdom. We continue on here. More more bad kings. Oh, we got one good one, Joash. And then Amaziah, that's Amos the prophet. Hosea is in here. The northern kingdom pretty much only has bad kings. The southern kingdom has some good ones, but this is where we are. Ahaz was a bad king of the southern kingdom, and the southern kingdom reached its lowest point. Most, most idolatry and the worst sort of idolatry to the point where King Ahaz even sacrificed his own son in the fire to one of these false gods. And so he had also shut the doors of the temple and people weren't worshiping anymore. And so this was the lowest point that Judah had seen so far. And so Hezekiah comes on the scene and he is a good king. And uh, in 29 verses 1 through 11, we see that he is starting to make reforms now. So in verse 3, he immediately begins restoring the temple. He's portrayed kind of as a second Solomon. Solomon was the one who built the temple in the first place and commissioned it. And so Hezekiah here is kind of like a second Solomon. He's being described in similar ways that Solomon was. And there, I don't know if you noticed this, but uh, it says in verse 3, in the first year of his reign, in the first month. So that means that this was like his first order of business. This was top on his agenda. We need to get worship right back in this country. That's what we need to do. So he immediately does this. And then in verse 5, He says to them, Hear me, Levites, now consecrate yourselves and consecrate the house of the Lord, the God of your fathers. There's urgency in his words. In fact, the word now appears three times in his his message to these Levites here. I remember there was uh, one summer when I was uh, working on uh, landscaping and such at Castle Park where Deirdre works, and there was me and one other guy, and 
we were clearing out leaves and trimming bushes and everything. And uh, we were kind of just talking and kind of, you know, casually working. And, uh, and the boss kind of saw that and he, he was kind of, he had this sense of urgency because he needed to get a lot done by the time the park opened. So he comes up to us and he gives us this lecture. Like, okay guys, we have this much to do in this amount of time. So we, we need a sense of urgency here. Because this park has to be ready by the time the doors open. It's like, oh, okay, I guess we will, we will uh, try to hustle a little more. This is kind of what I think of when I, when I read this. There's a sense of urgency to worship the Lord. He says in verse 6, Our fathers disregarded God and acted horribly. We just forgot about Him. We showed Him the hand. We slammed the door in His face. And we have disregarded Him. We've got we to get back. Verse 7, They neglected the temple. They neglected God's temple. They shut the doors. No incense is burned. And we don't use a lot of incense now these days. But some of you, I know, watch the Olympics. And if you watch the opening ceremonies, there's this flame that they light. And it burns for the whole Olympic time. And then there's this ceremony where they extinguish the flame once the Olympics are done. I mean, this is kind of what it's like. Imagine if the Olympics are still going on and the Olympic flame goes out. There's something symbolic about that that has meaning to it. And if that goes out, that's a bad sign. It shows neglect. It shows that we don't care. It shows that the things that we are doing this Olympics for are really nothing. The temple, the temple back then meant something a little different than, than it would today. The temple for them was a building. It was on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. And it meant God's presence among his people. So when people prayed back then, they prayed in the direction of the temple. When, when they had their ceremonies and their festivals, there were certain procedures for how people could enter the temple and which parts they could enter. So it was a really big deal because God was there. This is where God was among us. It's his dwelling place. So in Psalm 18, for example, it says, In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. So we, we pray towards the temple and God hears from his temple. Or Psalm 11, verse 4 says, The Lord is in his holy temple. This is where God dwelt. And if you neglect that, then that shows contempt for God. God loves his people and he wants to be near to his people. And they walked away. So Hezekiah says, we need to fix this. We need to fix the temple. We need to open its doors. We need to restore everything that it means so that people will worship. Now let's look at verses 18 through 21 here. Then they went in, that's the Levites, to Hezekiah, the king, and said, We have cleansed all the house of the Lord, the altar of burnt offering and all its utensils, and the table for the showbread and all its utensils, all the utensils that King Ahaz discarded in his reign when he was faithless, we have made ready and consecrated, and behold, they are before the altar of the Lord. Then Hezekiah, the king, rose early and gathered the officials of the city, and went up to the house of the Lord. And they brought seven bulls, seven rams, seven lambs, and seven male goats for a sin offering for the kingdom, and for the sanctuary, and for Judah. And he commanded the priests, the sons of Aaron, to offer them on the altar of the Lord. Stop there. It says in verse 20, He rose early and gathered the officials of the city, and went up to the house of the Lord. So it's like, as soon as he heard that the temple was ready, okay, next day, 
We're worshiping. It says he rose early. We're going to get started right away. Worship needs to be restored. So when the temple is ready, Hezekiah immediately begins proper worship. The text gives lots of details about the sacrifices, and it's all according to what the law of Moses said. There's a lot of details in these two chapters. And God gave the proper ways to make these sacrifices, and that's why there's a lot of attention to detail there. There's certain ways that God says, when you make this sacrifice, this is what you are to do. When you, are, when you observe this festival, this is how I want you to do it. And so they are recording here, we're following the way that God told us to. And God gave these proper ways to make sacrifices and observe festivals as opposed to what the nations there had done. So when the Israelites came into that nation, that area called Canaan, there were all these other nations, and they worshipped all these other gods in all kinds of ways that are sick and wrong, like sacrificing their children and kind of stuff. So God says, I don't want you to worship like they do. So when you come in, this is how I want you to worship. And that's why the Old Testament is filled with all these detailed descriptions of how they are to worship, make sacrifices, observe festivals. I don't want you to do it like they do it. Deuteronomy 12, 29-31. When the Lord your God cuts off before you the nations whom you go in to dispossess, and you dispossess them and dwell in their land, take care that you be not ensnared to follow them after they have been destroyed before you, and that you do not inquire about their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? That I also may do the same. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. So, distinct from the other kinds of worship of the nations. And in the next chapter, verse 24, you don't have to turn there. But it talks about all of the animals that Hezekiah donated so that the people could make the proper sacrifices. Hezekiah donated his own animals for these sacrifices. It says he gave the assembly a thousand bulls, seven thousand sheep for offerings, and the princes gave the assembly a thousand bulls and ten thousand sheep, and the priests consecrated themselves in great numbers. So he's giving of his own resources so that worship can happen. Look at verse 35 and 36. Last two verses of chapter 29. Besides the great number of burnt offerings, there was the fat of the peace offerings, and there were the drink offerings for the burnt offerings. Thus the service of the house of the Lord was restored, and Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced because God had provided for the people, for the thing came about suddenly. In other words, God was at work because everything happened so quickly. The temple was restored in a really short order. And they got these things going. And they saw God at work in that. For the nation that had neglected God, it was wonderful to see him working again. And if you'd been far from God, and there's this time when you don't notice God and you don't hear from God, and then suddenly you can see God working again. That's a wonderful feeling. So Hezekiah was a king, but he used his authority so that the people could worship. He was a priestly king. And he anticipates the true king and the ultimate high priest. Hezekiah restored the temple. Jesus restored the true temple by raising it in three days. Once Jesus came, the whole temple thing kind of changed. So... Jesus cleansed the temple in John chapter 2. And they said, what sign do you have to give us that you have the authority to do these things? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple. And in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. So Jesus' body is now the temple He is what symbolizes 
God's presence among us. We don't need a temple building anymore because the body of Jesus is God's presence among us as mortals. We have God's presence now. We have the real thing, not the thing that was pointing to the real thing. So God and mortal flesh dwell together. This is what Christmas is all about. This is why Christmas is so important and special. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. Hezekiah restored proper worship. Jesus restored proper worship in spirit and in truth. He was talking to this Samaritan woman, and she asked him, Okay, you Jews worship in Jerusalem, and we worship on this mountain. Which is the right way? And Jesus responded in John 4. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. It's not about a location anymore. It's not about a mountain or a temple building anymore. If, uh, if this building here that we are in right now, if this burned to the ground, we would still have services next Sunday. We would still all gather and we would still worship. So we worship not in this building. That's not the point of why we worship here. The point of us worshiping is that we are together worshiping. We talk about going to church. The church is not this building. I always thought about it that way, especially when I was younger. When you go to church, you're, you know, you're talking about the building. But really, it's the people. And Hezekiah gave much for the sacrifices for the people to worship. Jesus gave his own life for sacrifice. He made his sacrifice so that we, the people, could worship in spirit and truth. So that we could come before God without sin. That we could have the righteousness of Christ and worship in all authenticity. And Hezekiah interceded for his people. I missed a whole section here. Back up with me. If you're following on your outlines. Sorry about that, David. Turn to turn to Second Chronicles chapter thirty. Verses thirteen through twenty. Hezekiah intercedes for his people here. And many people came together in Jerusalem keep the feast of unleavened bread in the second month a very great assembly they set to work and removed the altars that were in Jerusalem and all the altars for burning incense they took away and threw into the brook Kidron and they slaughtered the Passover lamb on the 14th day of the second month and the priests and the Levites were ashamed so that they consecrated themselves and brought burnt offerings into the house of the Lord they took their accustomed posts according to the law of Moses, the man of God, the priests threw the blood that they had received from the hand of the Levites. For there were many in the assembly who had not consecrated themselves. Therefore the Levites had to slaughter the Passover lamb for everyone who was not clean to consecrate it to the Lord. For a majority of the people, many of them from Ephraim, Manasseh, Iskar, and Zebulun, had not cleansed themselves, yet they ate the Passover, otherwise than as prescribed. For Hezekiah had prayed for them, saying, May the good Lord pardon everyone who sets his heart to seek God, the Lord, the God of his fathers, even though not according to the sanctuary's rules of cleanliness. And the Lord heard Hezekiah and healed the people. So if you know the Old Testament, you had to purify yourself and go through a ritual before you could observe the Passover. And because the Passover was celebrated so quickly, there were lots of people who came from long distances and they didn't have time to do that. So Hezekiah, because they, didn't, they hadn't done that, he intercedes for those who are ritually unclean. 
So the rules for approaching the Lord in the temple were not followed. So he intercedes for them. He prayed to the Lord and said, Lord, even though they have not followed all these rules, they are coming here to worship you. They are coming here out of repentance for all that we as a nation have done. Would you please cleanse them and heal them? Would you make that okay? And it says the Lord heard him. So Hezekiah interceded for his people. Skipping back ahead here. Jesus intercedes for his people too. Romans 8 is quite a familiar passage to a lot of us. Romans 8 verse 34 says this, Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. So Jesus intercedes for his people too, as Hezekiah did, foreshadowing him. Let's look at the screen here. Why are you called a Christian? Because by faith I am a member of Christ, and so I share in his anointing. I am anointed to confess his name, to present myself to him as a living sacrifice of thanks to strive with a good conscience against sin and the devil in this life, and afterward to reign with Christ over all creation for all eternity. So we are prophets and priests and kings. As Hezekiah restored the temple building, Jesus restored the temple of his body. As kings and priests, the well-being of the church is the business of every believer. So the well-being of this group of people is the business of every one of you who believes. If you're a believer, then the well-being of this group of people is your business. Especially if you are a professing member. If you've stood up in front here and you've said, this is my church and I am a Christian and I belong here and we've committed ourselves to you and you to us, then the well-being of this group of people is your business. It's your responsibility. The temple is the body of Christ, and the body of Christ is the church, the people of God. And it takes sacrifice to serve the church. There's a lot of you out there who give your, your time, your money, your talents for this group of people. Take sacrifice to serve the church. So Paul says, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. In other words, I am suffering, Paul says, for the church, for the sake of the church. So if there's a church where 20% of the members do 80% of the work, that's not a healthy church. That's not a healthy church. That's, that's, that's the tendency. That's the tendency, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't think that we're exempt from that either. There's always that tendency to just, well, let the people who are involved take care of it. It's, this body is all of our business. Every one of us. The well-being of this group of people is all of our business. Hezekiah restored proper worship, donating even his own animals for the sacrifices. Christ restored proper worship, giving his own life. We restore worship when worship services are for God over our preferences. There's something called worship wars that pastors talk about a lot. You know, about what kind of music we're going we're gonna to sing in, in this, you know, traditional, contemporary, and all of that. And this sort of stuff, this tears churches apart. Really, all of it praises God. That's the reason for singing. That's the reason for gathering. Why would that tear us apart? If it's worshiping God, why would it tear us apart? 
That's really sad. God has prescribed ways of worship that is distinct from the rest of the world. So just like Israel, then they went into that land. God says, okay, I want you to worship me this way, not their way. And so, for example, singing. Now, I just want to say, first of all, that I, am, I have no problem with contemporary songs and contemporary worship. Guitars, drums, all of that, great. No problem with that at all. But I've been to some churches where the singing time is more about the band that's playing than the people singing. For example, if there's a band up front that is so loud that people can't even hear themselves singing, then it's not about congregational singing anymore. It's about a concert. Then worship is not about all of the people praising God. It's about the talents of the people up front. And so, worship needs to be about all of us praising God together. When the voices are drowned out, then it's not about that anymore. Then we might as well be at a Metallica concert. Worship is not to satisfy our tastes. This is God's time, not ours. We're here because of God, not to be tickled. We restore worship when we make worship about God. And Hezekiah interceded for his people when they were impure. Christ intercedes for his people even though we are impure in and of ourselves. So, I want to throw out a challenge to all of you here. Let's all pray that our worship is always pleasing to God. Let's all pray that. Right before the service, the elders get together with the pastor and they pray. And they pray for this worship service, that it would go well, that it would be pleasing to God. Let's not just leave that to the elders. Let's make sure that all of us are praying that. Because it's so easy to be here for the wrong reasons. It's easy to be here because somebody made you come or somebody is expecting you to come. You know, another person, not God. Or maybe some of you are here because I want to be seen here. Maybe some of you are here because you think being a Christian means your butt in a seat for an hour. It's easy to be here for the wrong reasons. When we worship the Lord, let's make sure that our hearts are right with Him and that we're here for the right reasons. Hezekiah gave wealth of animals for the people to worship. Jesus gave his life so that we could worship. Let's give of our means so people can worship. And that's not just money. That might mean your time or your abilities in some way. Because worshiping together as a body, this is our most important responsibility. Anyone with means should contribute to the worship of God so that God is praised. As I was preparing for this sermon, I was just kind of thinking and typing and I uh, kind of came up with this. So we exercise authority as kings to make worship happen. Anyone with money has power and authority. When the right amount of money is in your pocket, you can walk into any store and have any item or service that you want. Money gives us earthly power. As kings sharing in Christ's anointing, let's use earthly power to produce something of heavenly value. Continual worship and enjoyment of all God's delightful qualities is what makes heaven heavenly. That's why it's a wonderful place. Another gadget or trinket in our hands means nothing. Making worship of God happen has eternal value to an eternal God. It draws us into his presence it causes our eyes to focus on him. It renews our minds to what is truly good. It grounds us in transcendent truth. It surrounds us with divine love that overwhelms 
even the best human love, like holding a candle in a dark room that opens the door to a bright, sunny day. Nothing compares with worship. Hezekiah was a king, but he took the priestly role very seriously, used his power and his resources so that everyone would worship properly. So as priests and kings, you and I, let's use what we have so that everyone worships the Lord in truth, in spirit and in truth. And when we do that, that's when we see God at work, just like they did. And we've seen God work here many times and in many ways. Let's continue to do that. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord, our God, worship of you is is so important because, Lord, you are a wonderful God. And being in your presence here together, giving you praise, is our ultimate end. Lord, help us to always be here for the right reasons, to worship you in spirit and truth. And Lord, to be able to give whatever we can so that this body would be edified and that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.